So, hello everybody. We are at the Root Camps webinar series. We are at our fourth, fourth webinar right now. Today's topic is soil microbiome. We want to look what's behind the bus, what is uh, the technology offering, what can we expect. I'm very happy to uh, have a strong panel today. Um, I'm introducing the, ra the way around. Uh, very happy to have uh, Joschka Gerenda here. He is Chief Agronomist of K plus S and also Managing Director of the Institute of Plant Nutrition of the University of, um, of Göttingen. Then uh, I am very happy to introduce Alberto, co-founder of Biome Maker. Uh, we have Andreo, um, the bioinformatician uh, of Sequentia uh, Bio. Then uh, we have Francis, uh, he is R&D manager at uh, Gallego. Uh, Lutz is uh, streaming in from uh, New York City, actually, uh, co-founder of uh, BioLevel. And uh, last but not least, I'm very happy to have uh, Tom here joining uh, from Ghent. Uh, and uh, uh, he is um, a project lead at Afia Bio. So this is a very strong lineup of um, solution providers uh, in the microbiome field. But now I'd like to um, uh, show you a little bit about uh, the root camp. What are we actually doing? Why are we in the position to actually bring this content to you on the DLG Connect platform? Uh, root camp is a multi corporate innovation hub. We look for agri food tech, we look for solutions from bioeconomy. Um, our, our aim is actually to build a network and ecosystem to leverage the agri food innovations and bringing really the, the challenges to a scaling position. And uh, so our mission is to bring corporate innovation and combine that by startup inspiration. And uh, so to do so, we help startups, we help corporates, and we see ourselves as a catalyst for these hopefully commercially viable corporations of these two parties. What is the focus, the topics we are looking at? We're looking for the upstream side of the agri-food uh, agri venture uh, value chain, starting from the soil, soil health or seeds. We go through agribusiness, also the R&D side, and then into the sustainability, the applications, the processes uh, from the bioeconomy side to bring the input streams towards, the, um, towards feeding the world. Um, how are we financed? What is our business model? The root camp is financed by the industry. K plus is our founding and a strategic partner. We also have KWS, the um, uh, seed company, um, as our partner and also regional partners like the regional Hannover Imports, Agritechnica, which platform we are using right now and also supported uh, uh, by a KPMG. We have another part that is the Spin Lab. Uh, it's an accelerator in, in Leipzig. They are looking for energy, smart infrastructure and digital health. And they have also a comparable lineup of strategic investors like, like we do. And um, uh, what are the products that we offer? First of all, the inspirational part, we offer a startup acceleration. We look for early stage startups uh, that we help to uh, go towards the investor readiness. We have an educational program, 12 intense weeks. Uh, we will cover everything that's related or that's needed for the startup to go to the next phase. And in addition, we prepare a concept uh, of a pilot project together with our corporate partner. And this so-called integration project will then be conducted in the next three to nine months. We also for that have an additional uh, project budget. But we not only look for the very early stage startups, we look also for established products, established technologies. There we have a shorter ramp up phase since the technology is already established. But again, we move over to a pilot project to validate what the technology is there, to bring the information to the corporate partner and to the startup if there is uh, room for corporate, uh, for commercial cooperation. Also for the internal innovation, we look for a creation of uh, new innovation. So the in, uh, entrepreneurial incubation is an offer for corporates that want to support their innovative thinking employees. Everything uh, combining is uh, our aim to deliver the right information for strategic decisions, for making the right decisions 
Um, and uh, so this is something that we uh, we are really aiming for. Um, e even a negative decision is actually a good decision when it's based on a great on a great uh, basis. But uh, we surely aim for the for the uh, ongoing part. This is the portfolio we have right now. So it's the early stage companies that conducted our um, currently our two batches we conducted last year and we are conducting actually right now. So you can see that's quite a broad field of uh, of topics we are covering. And uh, this is actually who is running the root camp. My name is Philip Rittershaus. I'm a trained biologist and uh, Gaia is our program manager. So taking care of everything our program needs. So going back to the to the panel, I would like uh, to hand over to to Yoshka to share the industry perspective and uh, telling us what everybody already knows that is highly trained in this in this topic. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for this introduction and um, also um, well now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to share uh, some thoughts regarding the soil microbiome. Uh, relating to what's behind, behind the buzz. buzz. Um, um, well, the soil, the soil microbiome, microbiome is, is the community the of soil microorganisms and their genomes, and it is key for soil quality. And soil quality itself is an important component of the environmental quality, aside next to water quality and air quality. Among these, the soil quality is definitely uh, the most difficult and the complex one. It is the capacity of a soil to function within ecosystem boundaries to sustain biological productivity, maintain environmental quality and promote plant and animal health. All right, soil quality or soil fun health. Now, soil quality is governed by a number of soil attributes, which can be grouped into the physical, the chemical and the biological ones. Out of these the biological ones we are dealing with today. Um, so it's to do with the soil organic carbon, with its turnover, microbial activity, mycorrhiza, and so forth. And these biological soil attributes are key for, for soil processes shown on the right, like uh, nutrient cycling, water cycling, um, organic matter turnover. And these again, of course, are key for the ecosystem services shown on the far left. So when we um, analyze the soil microbial or when we deal with the soil microbes, um, originally focus has been to identify certain organisms or taxa, um, but nowadays focus should also be on the functional groups. So we ask what is the function of a certain organism within the soil ecosystem. So we have the decomposers, the ecosystem engineers, and of course the soil borne pests and diseases. And these functional groups ultimately relate to the ecosystem functions as they are nutrient cycling, nutrient uptake, and of course um, the control of uh, biological control of pests and diseases, biocontrol. And this now leads us to um, the overview, say, of biostimulants and biopesticides. Um, on the left, shown in blue, is the biofertilizers and biostimulants, which are considered one group nowadays, more or less. Um, so we are dealing with the N2 fixing bacteria, um, phosphate solubilizing bacteria, and then the biostimulants, whether it's microbials or whether it's organic or humic or whatever acid. And these are regulated in Europe, for example, by the European Fertilizing Product Regulation. On the right, we see in green color the biopesticides or biocontrol products. Again, either biochemicals or microbials. And these, of course, belong um, or are regulated by the plant protection products regulations and the governing laws. So when it um, comes to biostimulants, um, from what we know, it's also there's a lot of uncertainty associated with their use. You'll, I'm sure. Uh, um, uh, the other speakers will, will refer to that. Um, and it's often difficult to identify a biostimulant which really works in the farmer's field. And um, 
allow me to share with you this slide uh, shown by Professor Brown from the U University of California last year during a IFAR conference, um, showing the result of a number of field trials with maize um, on the effect of biostimulants. And you can see that in many cases there's a positive effect, but also in some cases there is a negative effect. And um, in fact, just last week, during the Global Forum of, for Food and Agriculture, um, a group from uh, Switzerland showed uh, this slide um, showing you the uh, mycorrhizal growth response of uh, crop species from uh, several field experiments. And again, you see in many cases there's a positive response, but also there's sometimes a negative response, particularly uh, when using cereals. So I think there is a lot of uncertainty and um, ultimately at K plus S as a fertilizer company originally, we are also interested in biostimulants. Um, at the moment, however, we focus more on the organic acids and humics. Uh, while we feel that we need to develop a deeper understanding uh, regarding microbials. And uh, for that very reason, I'm very happy to interact with the other representatives of the various companies today. And I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you. So many thanks. Uh, uh, many thanks, Oscar. Uh, Yashka, sorry. Um, was uh, fighting with my with my microphone. So uh, perfect. That was a good start. Uh, I, I would be very happy to hand over to Alberto. Um, you're you call yourself 23 me of the soil microbiome. So what what do you bring to us today? Thank you very much. Also, it's for me a pleasure to be here with uh, all these people working in uh, microbiome field in the life part of the soil. Let me show my screen. Okay. Well, well, at Biomakers, um, we are on a, st uh, on a startup based on, on US, but also with uh, global activity. Oh. Um, Alberto, just go on presentation mode, maybe? Yeah, no. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. OK. Um, yeah, with global activity, our um, objective is to develop a specific tools to understand the complexity and decoding the complexity of microbial interactions in order to apply this biomarker uh, to improve the sustainable agriculture. Our initial goal was to attach this kind of global problems. Uh, the global population is growing. Uh, we have now a climate crisis and also due to the specific uh, conventional management practice the last 40 years, we lost one third of arable soil. With arable soil, it's not possible to grow food to uh, promote that global population. Well, our vision is uh, to recover uh, soil health uh, worldwide. Uh, and especially, I agree with, uh, the, with the Dr. Joska uh, about the specific definition of what is the soil health. Well, if we understand or we want to measure uh, something that have the word health, is because we need to be alive. And for sure, then we can discuss about uh, functional interactions, living ecosystem, or well, to maintain and to provide the, the plant growth, right? Uh, in this case, uh, to uh, develop a specific indicators to measure uh, soil health and to understand that the different product and management practice can impact in the life part of the soil, we develop a system that we can collect soil samples we can isolate the DNA of the soil samples and to profiling the microbes that are present in the soil. In this case, we are specializing in bacteria and fungi. And from that specific microbes at taxonomy level, develop functionality indicators. Indicators linked with biodiversity, indicators linked with nutrient mobilization, functionality of the, of the microbes, 
uh, indicators about uh, stress, because if there is high level of salinity or if there is uh, a lot of drought, there are the specific microbes living in that ecosystems, and also the uh, healthiness perspective of the plant. No, this is risk of biocontrol species. Well, to develop those indicators, you need a specific reference. That's one of the lack of information uh, that we can find in soil microbiome. What kind of reference are available? For that reason, uh, we developed the, I think, the bigger microbiome database worldwide, counting thousands and thousands of samples from America, Europe, and scaling also in other parts of the world right now. In order to understand what are the specific um, uh, limits of different indicators that we can develop. Well, in the same way that the people start to measure, uh, I don't know, the air pollution, uh, you need to understand what are the limits that can be under health or not health in this case of the soil. Uh, with that, we develop also a tool that can be applied easily for farmers, agronomists, also retailers, etc., in order to apply this kind of information in a very simple and useful way. Uh, let me show you some examples. This is a disease risk map that is possible to draw in our portal. It is based on the pathogen detection and also not only the abundance of the pathogens in the soil compared with other samples in our database from the same crop, if not also a bit more complex, uh, implementing here the level of, uh, um, for example, biocontrol species that we are detected and the ecology of the sample. Uh, but this is simple. Here are three parcels, and in one of them, we can detect some specific risks of actragnosis linked with avocado trees, for example. Well, other thing that we are able to measure uh, is not only the amount of uh, nutrients that are present in the soil. We are able to understand the genetic potential of the, all the microbial population that is living in each soil in order to understand if that specific microbes are working in one direction of the, this, for example, nitrogen cycle or in another direction. And depending if this specific balance of the genetic potential is in one direction or in others, it's more easy that the plant can get nutrients or for the opposite, white, opposite uh, part that the plant cannot get nutrients because microbes are using that nutrients in, in their benefit, right? And this is how we saw these indicators. If we have high level of nitrogen mobilization, it's because microbes have the potential to transform the different chemical compounds in the soil to get that with more availability to the plant. In the opposite way, if the, if the microbes are competing with the plant for that nutrient. Well, that's very easy to understand. Uh, is not only depending on the amount of nutrient that is present in the soil, and very high correlated with the amount of nutrient that then we can measure on the leaves. For sure, there are many, many interests on uh, soil health linked with management practices, the concept of regenerative agriculture, for example. Here, we are using a biodiversity index based on network properties that we publish in one of the top journals of microbiology. When we demonstrate that in any part of the world, in this specific crop in vineyards, but is applied to any other crop, we can establish difference in network properties in the way that the microbes have in relationship with each others. And establish here a specific rating if the microbiome in the soil is very specialized, creating uh, specific clusters of activity. Here, H dot is uh, a microbe, and the lines are the specific relationship between H others. Well, we can establish that it's a very specialized system because farmers is specialized in the system with the kind of chemicals and management that they, they is applying. For the other hand, in other uh, specific management systems like organic or biodynamic, we saw a trend that in general is less specialized because there is no clusters and the ecology of the samples is turning in a different way. Compiling mil, uh, thousands of samples, uh, we can create this specific rank that can reflect the level of intensity of farming practices 
that can be reflected also in the life in the soil. The last part of my presentation is, okay, we can diagnostic soil health. The next step is to understand what is the effect of the different products can be new biologicals, new biostimulants, biocontrol products, or regular chemical products in order to how that product is affecting to the life that is living in the soil. Well, here we develop a kind of system. We have now two papers published, one of, uh, with the uh, UC Davis, another with uh, Bayer Group Science that we demonstrate that is very effective. We only need to select control place, treated place, different locations, taking samples before and after in order to understand what kind of effect uh, can run the specific product that you are applying in the soil. If we understand what can be the effect in biodiversity, nutrient mobilization, abiotic stress, or disease risk, well, we can, we are able also to recommend what can be the best product that can influence in your specific microbial communities in the soil in order to improve your soil health, healthiness and also your productivity. Well, uh, this is possible also because uh, it's necessary to work a lot in uh, a lot of research in the soil microbiome field. We have here our non-profit initiative, Fields Forever, working with more than 160 different entities worldwide in seven different topics like soil health, carbon sequestering, or the impact of the different inputs or management practices in the life in the soil. Well, that's how we understand that we can apply soil microbiome to get specifically indicators that can improve the sustainability in agriculture. Okay, many thanks, Alberto. There was a lot of information. <laughs> um, uh, so I hand over now to uh, Andrew. Um, what uh, are you actually doing at Sequentia? Yeah, hello, everybody. I'm, bio, I'm the bioinformatician of Sequentia Biotech in charge of uh, microbiome. Let me first of all uh, share the screen. You see my screen, right? So uh, I'm the bioinformatician at Sequentia Biotech and I'm going to introduce you briefly uh, what we do and what uh, we have developed uh, to study the environmental samples like uh, soil samples. Um, we are based in the center of Barcelona and we offer end-to-end uh, -end solutions and uh, consulting services in the field of bioinformatics to customers working in basic, applied and uh, industrial science. Uh, beyond the consulting services, uh, we also develop uh, custom software for our customers and easy to use cloud software to allow non-bioinformaticians to analyze their own uh, data. And in the next slides, I'm going to show you one of our cloud platforms to analyze uh, microbiome data. We analyze any kind of omics data ranging from genomics, uh, transcriptomics, epigenomics to the microbiomics field. As you probably know very well, uh, there are uh, three ways to analyze microbiome data. Sequencing a genetic marker, such as the 16S ribosomal RNA, sequencing the entire genomes or the entire transcriptomes of the samples. All of them have advantages or drawbacks. Nevertheless, sequencing the entire genomes or transcriptomes is computationally challenging in terms of memory and CPUs that are required disk space and complexity of the pipelines. In this context, uh, we developed an online platform in which you upload uh, a FASTQ, the, the FASTQ data, which contains the sequencing data from any kind of microbiome analysis, and you get uh, the results in your browser. This software is called Gaia, and the manuscript is uh, at the moment published in BioArchive. Uh, it performs taxonomic profiling of the sample, identifying prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and viruses. The functional profiling of the sample is also carried out in case of uh, performing metagenomics or metatranscriptomics. In case of uh, multiple experimental conditions, 
uh, are, if these experimental conditions are defined within the platform, the software also performs uh, pairwise differential analysis between the conditions. In the manuscript, uh, there is also a benchmark done and uh, gadgets found among the top most uh, accurate software in order to analyze microbiome data. The analysis is done in two steps using a simple web browser. You upload the sequencing data and then you create the analysis. After a few minutes in case of amplicon sequencing or after a few hours in case of metagenomics or metatranscriptomics, the results will be available. Regarding applications of metagenomics, uh, there are millions of unknown bacteria in very different environmental conditions. Its enzymes could improve the performance of some current industrial processes, as well as uh, some metabolites, for instance, of these enzymes could be pharmacologically active. In the soil, some microorganisms also influence the productivity and health of crop plants, for instance, uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria. And finally, some species can act as biosensors or indicators of contamination. And some other species uh, have the potential to perform bioremediation in a contaminated area. In this context, microbiomics provides us uh, a set of tools to study the microorganisms living in, this, in these areas. One of the problems to study samples from unknown environments, such as uh, seawater or soil, is that uh, in many samples, most of the reads, the sequencing reads, remain unclassified. This happens because uh, the reference databases uh, don't include the genome of the species reads come from. One solution to this is to extract the unclassified reads and perform a discovery analysis in order to rescue the genome of the novel species. We are implementing uh, in Gaia, in the online platform, a plugin that takes the unclassified reads of the samples and performs a de novo assembly to generate contexts, which are the pieces of the novel uh, genomes of the, of the species that are in, in the sample. Afterwards, contexts are expected to come from the same species are uh, grouped in, in, in bins, or in other words, metagenome assembled genomes, MAGs. Finally, MAGs undergo uh, taxonomic profiling. Uh, and these MAGs are taxonomically, uh, taxonomically classified uh, and located in a phylogenetics tree according to the average nucleotide, nucleotide uh, identity uh, of the genomes. And to conclude, uh, Sequentia Biotech is a company that performs uh, bioinformatic con uh, consulting and development using sequencing data. In this context, we develop different online tools to democratize bioinformatics analysis for non-bioinformaticians. Uh, one of these tools is Gaia, which uh, provides uh, taxonomic and functional profiling of microbiome samples. In terms of analysis, studying environmental samples like soil samples is challenging due to many reads remain unclassified. And for these cases, in order to handle this problem, more complicated pipelines, including genome assembly, are required. And finally, uh, with these pipelines, we can deepen the knowledge of the microorganisms with impact in plant yield, pharma, industry, and contaminated areas. And that's it. Thank you for uh, your attention. Many thanks. Um, so that was a deep dive into how to spotlight the totally unknown uh, from the omics uh, perspective. So many thanks for that. I'm uh, heading over uh, to uh, Francis, um, who is uh, at Gallego and uh, showing what you keep in mind and what you are the topics of service are. Uh, would you want to take over? Yes. Um. It's OK for. Yeah, just go in presentation mode, then, then it will turn. Right. Is it OK? Yes. You see my screen? Yes, we do. Perfect. OK. So, um, yes, I am a co-founder of the company Gaia Go. 
and um, I am also the, uh, the responsible for innovation in this uh, company. So, uh, as you can see on this first uh, slide, we are absolutely convinced that man uh, can be alive on e only if soils are, are alive. Um, um, all around the table are convinced that we made uh, really um, a view, uh, a global view uh, on, on this uh, uh, phase. So uh, it's a young company. It was established in 2014 in, in France. We have uh, eight years of uh, history, of trials, and now of uh, work with um, laboratories and uh, namely a research centers such as Unilasal, which is connected with many, many laboratories in the, in the world. And we produce in uh, Brittany, in, uh, in France, and we have now expanded uh, um, almost all over Europe and uh, now with the trials uh, over America, uh, Latin America, Canada, and uh, also in, in Africa. We are 60 people. So just to give you a, an idea with our, our environment, we have some impact investors who believed in us and invested heavily uh, in our project. It was in 2021, very recently. And we are associated with big uh, industrial um, food producers. And what we are believing is that 80 problems we are facing now, uh, that is to say weeds, diseases, uh, insects problems and so on, originate from the soil. That's why we want absolutely to put back the soil at the center of agronomy up to now everybody took care of the crop itself, of what was seen by everybody, by the farmer at the first place. And uh, uh, of course, um, some um, uh, uh, events, phenomena, which occurred under the soil were, were overlooked. So that's why we imagine uh, an approach, a global approach. And the first is, the, the following one, solving physical and chemical limiting factors. Calcium, magnesium, ratio, uh, phosphorus and so on. It's very important because everybody takes care of microbiome now that, you know, the soil is like a gross medium and we have to take care. I take it only one example. If you have no molybdenum, then the diazotroph, that is to say the nitrogen fixing microorganisms, won't work. The second point is to stimulate and to revive indigenous microbiome before trying to inject in the soils uh, exotic uh, microorganisms. We absolutely believe we have to wake up well what is already inside the, the soils. And finally, uh, sometimes it can be useful to provide the soil with some efficient strains which can uh, have disappeared. Some diazotrophs, for, for example, or plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, which can uh, disappear. So the first step, first, to bring everything which is needed by the microbiome. You know, uh, the tools of the microbiome are enzymes, and enzymes are for most enzymes uh, activated by trace elements, by minerals. And if, if you forget that, then of course the profile of the microbiome will not be ideal. The second point, is to just look at what is around the fields, what is around uh, uh, an area, and what we are looking at in our 
temperate countries is that the normal, the usual uh, vegetation is simply forest. And what we measured in past decades is that the fungi are decreasing in cultivated soils. That's why we have to wake them up. That's what we imagined. And why is it so important? It's so important because fungi are very, very efficient, for example, to store, to sequester carbon. They can sequester up to 50% of what they intake. Um, uh, whereas the bacteria have not the same efficiency. Uh, that's, of course, a global view. And we try to wake up what is inside the, 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 the soils because we are very lucky because the spores, that is to say, the forms under which the, the fungi are able to resist and to remain dormant, are very resistant and they can be there for decades without being dead and nevertheless to uh, uh, while being uh, still uh, to, to wake up and we saw that in a matter of weeks we were able to wake up as well mycorrhiza that is to say the mycorrhiza uh, the, 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 the fungal mycorrhiza and uh, also the saprophytes. Uh, so it's very important to be aware that soils are not dead. The third step, I would say, is to um, bring uh, the help of some strains which, which are very useful. They are useful not only for uh, biodiversity, but, but also for what they bring to the plants, what they bring to the crops. And I chose for this presentation only the Azotobacter crococum. We made many, many trials with uh, the Azotobacter crococum, and we found that it could be useful not only for grasses, but all, also for legumes. And what we observed uh, was systematically increases uh, in uh, uh, yields in weeds, barley, rapeseed, corn, sunflower, sugar beets. And uh, uh, what is uh, important also, in limited areas, we proved uh, where we have problems with water quality, we proved that we could maintain yields with less chemical nitrogen, up to 40, 45 kilos. It was possible while maintaining the yields. So it's, of course, particularly important. So what we are believing really is that the next uh, shift uh, in agriculture will not be a wonderful product, but it will be certainly a new global approach which takes into account the soil, the fertilization, the crop rotation, and uh, of course potentially uh, the beneficial uh, my, uh, uh, microbes which could be brought directly in, in, in the soil. So, thank you. Uh, Gallego is specialized in this global uh, approach. Thank you. Perfect. Many thanks, Francis. So, now we have sort of met the middle of the, of the panel. Um, I'm uh, very happy to go over to Lutz. Um, so what what are you aiming to deliver to the soil at bio level? Yeah, thank you for having me uh, today at this event and on this panel. Bio level is a specialist in biofertilization. The company is eight years old, but the um, team members and co-founders are working on um, soil health and bio nutrition since almost twenty years. 
um, one of my co-founders is a leading soil scientist who almost 20 years over 15 years ago looked at the available biofertilization products and saw that they were not working under real life farming conditions. So he partnered with an uh, environmental microbiologist to come up with um, something which is really performing under real life conditions on the farm. The work at BioLevel was focused on design, development and productization. If we look at the first pillar, which is very important for design, um, Professor Gerendas talked about the functional groups and we at BioLevel are very focused on our functional groups being biofertilizers and not biocontrol. We stayed clear of biocontrol aspects in our work from the beginning and throughout our development work. And this is what makes our products, in our opinion, now regulation proof. We also focus on soil bacteria. We um, are big um, fans of uh, fungal products as well, but we often see that bacteria are the more robust and primary colonizing um, bacteria in the soil rhizosphere and that very often soil bacteria can set the solid foundation for uh, fungal products to perform better afterwards. Um, the design work was also centered around synergistic consortia. We do not work with um, individual strains. Our products always have seven or eight uh, bacterial strains in this. Um, this gives us a higher win rate and also means that our product really works um, under recognition of the synergistic effects in the soil rhizosphere. And this goes back to our understanding of soil health that ultimately we started to work with bacteria coming from a perspective of soil health. So we always have the overall picture in mind. If we look at the development work, um, we are talking about 15 years of selective breeding. Our work is always non-GMO which means that um, our products can be used across all countries and, um, and growing systems. And in the selective breeding, we increased the performance level of the microbes, primarily around um, robustness. This, um, for example, includes developing strains which can be used with tap water and not only uh, chlorinated uh, tap water, not only well water. This includes performance optimizing the strains to a um, broad range of temperatures. So we, our products do not require refrigeration. It includes high, uh, low pH levels, uh, mineral contents levels, and so forth. And um, this selective breeding effort and the resulting robustness of the strains is the necessary foundation for the productization into then truly easy to use uh, products for the farming community and also for the supply chain. We have um, a whole range of products ranging from seed treatments over fertilizer treatments, infero spray applications, broad acre spray, and always at a very um, ultra low rate application rate. We are the only company in the industry who has um, microbial liquid seed coatings which are packaged and sold as unrefrigerated liquids and are ready to go on the seed. Another specialty of ours is also the impregnation of um, granulated products, for example, granulated liming products or granulated um, fertilizer products. We have very consistent results. We are um, a small company, but we are rapidly growing and geographically expanding. We are currently present in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands, in uh, North America, in East Africa. We are currently expanding within Europe. We are expanding into Australia and also South and Central America. And we have formulated um, bacterial consortia for a whole range of crops, ranging from corn over cereals to potatoes and uh, vegetables. Perfect. Many thanks, Lutz, for this um, really uh, focused view on what you can uh, deliver with the consortium. So from the research and analytical and informational side, we had been over um, 
over to the reactivation uh, of the soil. We now have the consortium and last but not least, uh, I'm happy to turn over to Tom, who's uh, adding more and more complexity by also having a view on, on uh, actually the plant microbiome. You're, you're muted still. Okay, that should be better. Yeah, let me share my screen. Uh, is it uh, visible? The, yes, let's go in presentation mode, I guess. Okay, super. Okay, so thank you for the invitation. And I just have a few slides um, on Afia Bio. So I'm a co founder of Afia Bio, and I'm currently also working there as um, R&D program lead for both the biostimulant and also the bioherbicide uh, project uh, very recently. So, um, okay, so we are an R&D company. Um, we are based in Belgium, Ghent, and we were spinned off from uh, the VIB together with the university in 2017, so five years ago. And we are currently uh, 40 employees, so we are uh, growing pretty fast. Uh, the goal of our company is actually the development of what we would call um, agricultural biologicals, and the focus is specifically on um, natural microorganisms, so non-GMO uh, living microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, and uh, yeast. And uh, we have developed what we would call an R&D platform that is, uh, well, selecting uh, winners in uh, all our projects. Um, we have the ambition to become actually what we would say a one-stop shop for agriculture microbials. So both biocontrol, biostimulant and um, uh, products that we aim uh, to develop. And quite important is that especially we try to be in line uh, with uh, the Green Deal from Europe and the farm to fork strategy. So the reduction of, um, of pesticides and of nutrients. Uh, oh, not of nutrients, of um, fertilizers uh, in our agriculture. So, um, yes, so the focus specifically is on cereals. So we are aiming at uh, the large acre crops, uh, wheat and maize, uh, specifically in Europe. And uh, if we talk about biostimulant products, then we aim to develop seed coatings. And there the goal is to reduce the use of synthetic fertilizers. Um, so we aim at um, increasing the yield through um, improved uptake from nutrients such as uh, nitrogen and uh, phosphorus. So biostimulant products is, 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 is my uh, project, but then we also have other projects, biocontrol projects, where it's more focused on, on, on spray on uh, products to complement or to replace uh, the chemistry. And there we have uh, programs on biofungicides, bioinsecticides, and also very recently on uh, bioherbicides. So just a quick look at, at what we what we have in our R&D platform, and I just want to focus a bit on the biostimulants because there, of course, the microbiome has been an essential part in, in, in developing uh, our products. Eh? So in our discovery, uh, we focus or we have started with mapping uh, the microbiome of, of roots of our crops, so of maize and wheat, maize and wheat in uh, a huge diversity of soils. And so we try to understand what type of microorganisms colonize the root, which stay in the rhizosphere, and then specifically also under which conditions that happens. Uh, so we have the plate with nitrogen, with phosphorus, uh, just trying to understand what goes on. And, and we have been generating hypotheses to test microorganisms. And we are focusing on root colonizing microorganisms and also on bacteria that are not so easily to cultivate or that have not been isolated uh, before. And so we have been screening roughly 1500 uh, strains a year. We do that through automatic phenotyping and uh, we are currently in, in validation in the field. And I just highlighted here also for the biostimulants, we are um, uh, also building consortia. And also here we have used microbiome guided selection. So we use that, we use co-occurrence networks to try to identify which bacteria could exist together um, in the roots and could be applied uh, through a seed coating. Um, and then uh, just one one slide on on what our product uh, will look like. So we we focus mainly on yield increase. Uh, so for both for wheat and maize, we focus on an increased yield 
under a, a, a reduced fertilization. So 20 percent had to be in line with, 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 with the Green Deal. But then also we see, of course, that our root uh, system um, is boosted by our microorganisms and that we have even in the field have a stronger emergence, more even emergence, um, which is also helpful to the farmer. So that, are, that is basically um, uh, what we are doing at Afia Bio. All right. So perfect. Thank you very much, Tom, for this quick and intense and focused view on what you're doing. Um, so Joschka, going back, so you had the start actually. Um, I mean, uh, what you showed was also already a quite variety of results, and now we have uh, five promising uh, startups with very convincing and, and plausible uh, solution and stories. So now uh, is it up to you to say and to decide where are you going to and how to actually manage the complexity of information that is being out there on the on the scientific way, but also actually already combined in the in the offered products. So how you how do you think that what, what needs to change so that the, the, the room is there for um, bringing these solutions more and more into the soil? Um. I think it is really a key that um, the the conditions under which a farmer can expect the benefits from a certain product, because I mean there are many products on the market already to choose from, and I mean to really to identify those products which are really suitable for his specific conditions in the field and his crop, and the, also the history of of his field and and not of a uh, of a sampled field uh, somewhere in Europe, say. Uh, I think um, because only then the farmer will will also uh, be convinced uh, that I mean the benefits uh, justify the expenses. Um, and uh, I'm also very happy when when Tom referred to to yield increases because when we there are often many other indicators used, but honestly. When, as long as a farmer is not benefiting from improved quality, for example, huh, because the payment system simply <laughs> doesn't consider that, and there's very little hope huh, that it will be accepted or taken up by the farmer. I mean, these new improved biostimulants. Maybe we, I have more ideas, but maybe the others can also. I think I see some raised hands, so I stop here. Yeah, uh, I bet it's already eager. Um, uh, so uh, you're way into the analysis and, and making or the complexity handle uh, and, yeah offering solutions to to handle the complexity Alberto so uh, you want to take over yeah um, uh, I totally agree uh, with the last intervention because if I were a farmer today uh, I have like three different problems to achieve first the increased price of the urea is huge now they need to find solutions to replace the typical fertilization. Second, the availability of biostimulant, biological, biofertilizer product is huge. And one of the key problems is that all the people is selling uh, the kind of product based on the content of the product. OK, this is a consortia, this is a this is species, and all of them are magic because all of them are improving yields, are, are improving carbon, etc. But Maybe we need to turn from uh, the content of the product to the uh, specific effect that the, the product can provide under some kind of a specific conditions, you know, biological context or bi environmental context. That can allow to the farmer to choose the, 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 the specific solution. And in the case of biomakers, we try to help to, to choose the right solutions based on data in the in the trials that that people is running then when they apply the product on the field under different conditions because experience is nice is the way that now we are or, or people is recommending solutions but based on data is the key based on because this specific context is very similar to the context in the last trial we can get a probabilistic ensure that the product can be effective to run this kind of effect can be deal, can be increased uh, sustainability and other things. And totally agree that the third dimension today is the market. 
Uh, Gene, for sure, uh, is a key metric, but today people is demanding more sustainability production. You can look at the Starbucks, you can look at, uh, for example, um, McDonald's, you can look at Pepsi, all these specific food industries are now investment, investing a lot of money in regenerative agriculture in the way to change and build the way that the farmer is management the field in order to promote that sustainability. But we lack of metrics also to, to measure that. And that's one of the key things that the microbiome can provide. Yeah, um, I see uh, that uh, Lutz already raised her hand. Um, I have a question still for Andrew. So you're also in the field of generating information. You showed how deeply you go into your analysis to actually make the um, make the initial or the unknown space of, of the whole microbiome actually available and at least get in get in hold of, of what what you actually have there so how do you then uh, deliver this information to uh, in the end um, uh, help the farmers and uh, show that there is an effect and that you can provide um, uh, uh, benefits for uh, for the agricultural the yield side yeah basically um we need provide with our software uh, taxonomic and functional profiling, and this is more related to research because uh, there are many kind of soils uh, with many different microorganisms. The microorganisms that we find in the soil depends on the weather, depends on how rainy is the land, and depends on the season of the year. So there are many, many, many different soils with many, many, many different microorganisms. And most of them remain unknown. Uh, that's why we usually identify most of the sequencing reads uh, unclassified. They are unclassified because uh, the microorganisms remain unknown. So from the research point of view, we still need to, to we still need to deepen in the knowledge of the different uh, microorganisms living in the different uh, kind of soils because these microorganisms are unknown. These microorganisms might have different functions, and these microorganisms can uh, be beneficial in terms of uh, crop, uh, crop yield, increasing uh, yeah the, the health of the of the soil, etc. So we provide uh, different kind of tools. Omics, the omics uh, can provide different kind of tools to 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 increase in the knowledge of the different microbiomes. Yeah. Okay. We don't. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, with this information, uh, this is basically basic uh, research from the basic research. Uh, other uh, applied research can 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 have more influence in terms of products in agriculture. Okay. Um, uh, Lutz, you you also raised your hand. And you muted. Still. You, you are mute. Thank you. I would I would like to comment on the complexity of the microbial makeup of the soil, what this means to the farmer and product selection, and also tie this to the very interesting uh, piano graph, or two of them, Pro Professor Gerandes showed at the beginning, showing 75% positive response to microbial products, but also some, some negatives. Um, we see that the microbial analysis in soil can fluctuate greatly, even on the same field, um, taken at different points of provides an industry um, consistently performing products to the farmers to take the complexity out of this decision for the farmers. Um, if we look at our trial results, we have positive results above 80 percent so i think this is really what we have to strive for as as producers to get the win rate as positive as as high as possible it will never be 100 percent so what i like to do is to really to take a deep dive on those negative results we once in a while encounter and to try and to understand better what happened there um, for example in, in our case the negative um, trial results include trials where the nitrogen fertilization on a on a wheat field supported a 90 bushel yield target 
yet the control had only 63 and we didn't lift that any further. So I count that as a negative, but was the expectation that I pushed this. Nutrition and bionutrition was not the yield limiting factor in such a trial, yet it would show as a negative in a piano chart. Um, and what's also very interesting is that we conducted a multi-year trial program on corn silage where we saw that even conventional nitrogen fertilization products can have a negative impact once you cross a certain, a certain thresholds. Yeah? And um, that the addition of biologicals could fix that. So we had a better result under high nitrogen fertilization with biology than only the high nitrogen fertilization rates. So also starter fertilizers, for example, sometimes have not always positive results. So, um, but I, what I like to do is I like to peel the onion to look into the trial results and see, okay, let's not only look at the yield, but if I have a positive yield and I look levels down, do I see something which I would logically expect? For example, if I have a phosphorosolubilizing bacteria and I have now three and a half percent more yield in potatoes, let's look at the tubers. Do I have more tubers? Because that's what I would expect from the phosphorosolubilization um, to root development driving more tubers. So I want to validate my positive overall top line yield also in the understanding of the layers below and uh, use this one to, to convince the industry. So Tom, um, what do you want to add? You're still muted though? Yes, uh, sorry. So I just wanted to uh, get back to something the first speaker said was, you know, if you look at the several products that are currently on the market, they seem to tackle everything, you know, every crop, every type of uh, nutrient uh, deficiency, even diseases sometimes, you know, and I think that is a big problem for the image of biostimulants because, you know, nobody, at least I don't believe that, you know, one biostimulant product can do anything, you know, and that is maybe something in an, you know, ideal environment, you know, in a lab or in a grow chamber that would work. But we see that, you know, the moment you go to the field, you know, it's a whole different situation. So I think that is also where the field has to move away from, you know, from this general generic products using the same organism. So I think, well, th th that's, I think, a real challenge, you know, to 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 convince people that or the products we are developing are actually doing something. And and also a, a comment on the on the variability, you know, what we here also try to do is link all our data to soil characteristics because we have trials over the whole of Europe and we always try to link them to soil characteristics, rainfall, climate, you know, just to really understand, you know, when are they working, when are they working the best and, and, and so try to improve our product. So, so these are just two comments related to what other people said, but yeah, which I think are important. So that, that calls actually for a totally new level of uh, precision, yeah? So having different products to different applications to different soils. Um, Francis, you say that you are actually activating more or less what is already there. So um, is that a solution for one, one product fits all? Yes, uh, certainly it's a, it's a solution, you know, to, to use what is already there. Uh, it's my conviction. Uh, and when I was telling that, uh, I was thinking, you know, of compostees and so on. So, so this uh, uh, brewing which are made in the, in the barn, uh, which are something which is not very predictable. Uh, that's what I am thinking nevertheless, you know. Uh, microbiology is so complicated, so sophisticated that we need absolutely professionals. I wanted also to to add, and I, I quite agree with all that has been told. <laughs> we observe, uh, we have to be modest, you know, when we are in front of micro, microbes, microbiome and so on. And I wanted to add one point uh, that is to say we have also to educate people because uh, farmers, crop advisors and so on are so used to sides, you know, herbicides, insecticides, uh, fungicides and so on. So it's easy to kill. 
I, I would say. But to make life possible, you need air, you need nutrients, you need water, you need uh, enough but not too much and so on. And we have absolutely to educate them. And uh, I know that um, for, for Gallego, some, somewhat it, sometimes it's difficult also to implement trials because the, I just give one example. If you spray uh, uh, bacteria, small plots uh, are not the right tool because when you have only two meters wide, what will prevent this bacteria to go from the con from the treated plot to the control plot? Nothing. Two months afterwards, because of the bugs, of the wire, of the worms, uh, and so on, and, uh, and sometimes the splash of uh, the, the, the water drops, you know, and so on. <laughs> it, it has been spread uh, everywhere. So we have also absolutely to educate pe people, to uh, educate the crop advisors. Otherwise, they say, oh, there, there is no difference between control and treated. Of course. Uh, after a while, everything was treated. I made myself measures. Sometimes when you put uh, a bacteria on a field, uh, uh, six months afterwards on a winter wheat, we, you find 10 meters further the, the bacteria. So you understand you have also to choose the right uh, protocols and also the right key indicators. It has already been told, but uh, I, I, I have some examples in my head, you know. Uh, if the, the soil is saturated with nitrogen, the nitrogen fixing microorganisms will not work. Of course, the soil is saturated, it doesn't work for this type uh, of bacteria. Another example, if it is dry and then the, the bacteria are around the roots at 50 or 60 centimeters deep or even one meter deep, they go on working. And sometimes I, I even found up to four tons difference just because the crop received a message from its environment that nitrogen was available thanks to this deep bacteria, this bacteria living deep on, on the roots. Uh, and so the, the number of rows, you know, on the maize was kept, 18 rows, whereas, uh, whereas uh, the, the control uh, plot uh, did not benefit from this message at the right time. So the indicators are really different. Okay, Joska. So uh, we added even more complexity. So now we have uh, also the um, interaction between the different uh, microbials and the plants. Um, so is that somehow everything on the way that um, the farmer, the customer, can can handle that, or how is how is the way to actually bring this uh, microbiome technologies to scale? Well, actually, I, I wanted to comment uh, in, in a similar direction um, um, based on what Tom and Francis have already mentioned that um, um, and it's indeed to do with the digitization with the, with the uh, sensors being used, for example, when when it depends on the, for example, weather conditions, uh, whether there is a dry year and a certain biostimulant is not expected to work under any circumstances, but maybe only under dry conditions. Uh, I mean, fostering the strength of the plant, um, then it is, I would think it would help a lot if the industry would admit that maybe in a dry year, it would show good results, uh, and in a, in a normal year, the, the results are not so spectacular, or maybe plus minus zero. But maybe um, if it's a potato crop um, giving a rather good yield, then uh, if it if the biosimilar is working three out of five years, because three out of five years as a dry condition, I mean, then it may be beneficial for the farmer. And then we are back to modeling, traditional economic models, um, satellite uh, information, weather conditions, monitoring uh, to see, uh, I mean, maybe the biostimulant has to go in the field along with the seed, yes, but um, 
it, uh, from what Tom also emphasized, I mean, and also others have been mentioning, um, it helps a lot to, to explain, I mean, why the biostimulant worked in a particular condition, why it did not work. And when over the long term, in the long term, say, um, the, it's financially um, beneficial for the farmer to use the product to safeguard against dry, dry condition. I mean, that would already be a good achievement and it would certainly help a lot to convince farmers of the benefits of the product. OK, so um, that actually calls for a different business model that you only pay if you have uh, actually matched the uh, so the uh, expected weather conditions for this year. So that's definitely something we need to we need to think about. Um, uh, Alberta, what do you want to add to that? Since you are sort of uh, trying to deliver the vast yep. amount of information to uh, hopefully control these or predict these conditions. Well, it's a very good challenge. Uh, first of all, you mentioned uh, the complexity of the soil microbiome. To understand the complexity, it's necessary to take samples and to have a reference database in order to know how looks like that, com that complexity. But uh, in general, there are in other fields, people is management millions of data, for example, uh, social media or other, to anticipate trends, to uh, decode information in order, well, uh, to benefit in one direction. Uh, I think that it's possible to apply a similar machine learning algorithms or artificial intelligence in order to decode the complexity of the microbiome. And also, uh, you mentioned a microbiome can change uh, in one place uh, depending on the season, depending. Yes, I, I know because I tested. But if you compare that chain with a soil microbiome far to the block that you are testing, that uh, change is ridiculous. It's like compare the size of the Earth with the size of the Moon. Uh, for sure, they are, big, they are different. But if you put it in a context of a galaxy, the difference is ridiculous. OK, that's the similar thing uh, with the microbiome. In the case of how biomakers are applying that complexity, first of all is transparency. We are publishing demonstrations of our technology in order to demonstrate that it's possible. We demonstrate that we can anticipate the yield that can be expected on a field when you apply a biostimulant uh, be, before to or in the before to planting a potato, and that paper is published together with Bayer Crop Science. Um, the idea is to yes, microbiome as bioindicator, different things, and also metadata. The metadata is the management practice, the environmental conditions, etc. That is easily to collect based on the location of the sample, because right now we can play with satellite data and other sources of data to integrate. That was my, my thinking. And for sure, um, uh, in the case of uh, the education, well, looks, I'm not, uh, uh, for example, a specialized in informatics, or I was not a specialized in coding, but I can use an iPhone or a smartphone. OK, because it's easy in the way that we can provide easy tools to farmers and to final users that can touch in order to take decisions. For example, what kind of product apply? Well, it's, many, it's maybe the science behind how the iPhone is working is done, but the application of the iPhone is the key. How we can apply that knowledge that we are creating in order to help uh, the, the agriculture and to be more sustainable and more productive. But in my opinion, in the data that we have based on thousands and thousands of samples in different areas of the world, you need to decide higher yields or sustainability or find an equilibrium without decrease a lot uh, um, uh, yield, but to get a balance to be more productive and get sustainability for the future. OK, so the example of the iPhone uh, calls actually for crowd intelligence. So everybody should use the um, information uh, and, and work together. Lutz, you had your hand raised. And uh, so I give you two and then I would 
then slowly come to the final round. Actually, I see that there's so much information, so much uh, um, demand of exchange that we could go on for uh, for ages. And actually, yes, we can repeat that. But uh, for now, actually, the the time of the webinar is somehow somewhat limited. So um, Lutz, and if it's very fast, uh, Tom as well. You're muted, Tom. Uh, Lutz. Going back to the functional groups and the specificity which was mentioned, uh, I think we have to also differentiate between biocontrol and bionutrition, because in bionutrition, indeed, we have a much broader applicability. We have strains with some specificity to COP types, but we also have big overlaps, whereas in biocontrol, we more commonly see um, specificity. And um, another comment on the variability in results. For example, in potatoes, we average three and a half percent yield increase, which is very attractive in potatoes. We price it accordingly. Um, once in a while, there is a miss, but the farmers are fine with it because overall we have a very high win rate over 80 percent. But we also have sometimes frequently double digit yield responses, and we don't really understand why. We truly don't, right? So the variability really goes in both ways. Okay, Tom, real quick, last yeah. statement and then the final round. Yeah, so just something small on the functionality. So maybe something we also, also try to do is that we, if we know that one of our candidates, you know, works, for example, through colonization of the root or the rhizosphere, you know, and if we have like multiple trials over Europe, it's also something we try to monitor everywhere. So to really see that our thing is active there you know because you can apply it but you don't know whether it's you know maintained in the soil or in the root in our mm -hmm. case so that is just a little add-on to the functionality that that is besides the environment also your your product itself you would need to really monitor and follow so that's i think i guess also very important yes so um going to the to the final round uh, i would like to start with uh andrew um so Yes, we are always looking for the future and we are maintaining the hope and see that uh, it will evolve over time. It's still some, at least what I see right now, it's still quite a way to, to come actually to common knowledge here and uh, also share this knowledge with, uh, with everybody else out there uh, that is not deeply involved into a soil microbiome. But if you could wish, Andrew, what should happen in 2022 that will bring the whole area in the market of soil microbiome to the next level. OK. okay. Um, yeah, from, from the omics field, um, I'm always talking from this field because uh, I'm a bioinformatician, uh, a specialist analyzing omics data. I think that we should, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, what kind of product we can apply in a field, uh, I think that we should, first of all, uh, I think it would be wise to, to take a sample to perform taxonomic profiling to see what's inside a sample. Depending on the taxon uh, taxonomic profile or the functional profile, maybe we can apply one product or the other product. So before trying uh, different kind of products in order to increase the, 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 the the yield of any kind of uh, crop, for instance. It would be wise, in my opinion, to, 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 to check or to, to, to follow this line of uh, research in order to, first of all, know what's inside the sample, what kind of biomarkers we identify in that sample, and afterwards uh, we can apply in a kind of uh, of product, depending on the profile of that of that sample. Okay, so uh, no promise on yields without having a very close look. He's very short, Alberto. Do you wish okay. for you too? Well, uh, for me, there is an house of development in biocontrol, biostimulants, biofertilizer. Well, in the microbiome field, uh, you know Siri or Alexa, right? Uh, they're the virtual assistant for us at homes and everywhere. Well, at Biomakers, we are working and we expect to launch at the end of the year, the year a virtual assistant for uh, agronomists and farmers in order to help them to write the, the best solutions. We are working right now with 80 different developers worldwide 
testing uh, different products and building that uh, learning system to allow to recommend that solutions for the farmers. We expect to launch the four, four, uh, the four first uh, products probably at the end of the year. Okay, many thanks, Francis. You wish. You muted. Uh, Francis, you're muted. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> no, so, sorry. Yes, in uh, 2022, uh, really, I, I think it's very important to make success more frequent. That is to say, we have to define in which situations which microbials, which microbial community works or doesn't work. And we began, of course, last year's, but we are going on and um, um, we, we identified, for example, sulfur is a, an underestimated fertilizer. So many farmers spread uh, nitrogen because, uh, of course, you have yield, but if you forget some other elements, it really it, it can be con counterproductive. So I, I tell you only one element, but there are some other ones which are very useful. I give you, I share with you only one uh, ID. Uh, now for decades, uh, uh, people, farmers uh, spray trace elements only, only through foliar sprayings. Why forgetting that trace elements are also the core of enzymes. Okay, and, uh, so uh, you're, you're aiming for core for trace elements. I, I need to close it down right now. So I'm trying you to stop. Lutz, we had core uh, trace elements. Uh, what is your wish for 2022 that helps uh, soil microbiome uh, technologies the breakthrough? My wish is that the industry at large is continuing the path it is on. We see now that all major distribution channels are actively interested in trialing biologicals. We know that we deliver consistent results and that the moment we have an opportunity to trial, we will go into distribution. So I would encourage the distribution channels to continue this pathway. For us as a manufacturer, next year we have to continue our productization because convenient productization is key for adoption. Okay, so doing trials, having the verification, that's also something that we are on. Um, Tom. Yeah, for me, it would be, um, I hope we would try to better understand how the microbiome works uh, in agricultural systems uh, because we now describe it very well. But, you know, I think understanding how it works, understanding how the potential products do their job, better understanding, I think that's key to also improving them. So that's uh, what my wish would be. So, Joschka, you have the final word to close this uh, phenomenal round, actually, of <laughs> I haven't had uh, so much of complexity. So, actually, it's a great need for the industry to tip in and uh, also uh, uh, show the helping hand, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Philip. Well, I mean, I, I mentioned that, I mean, we are not really uh, at the forefront of, of this industry, um, but of course we are closely watching. And um, indeed, um, I, I also see great uh, potential in the combination of um, biofertilizers or say biostimulants uh, at least, um, and, and other products which are regularly applied. I mean, um, of course, seed coating is one issue, uh, one, one option, but whenever applying very small amounts of an in inoculant, I mean, why not using uh, other products which go in larger quantity? Uh, they are very easily spread evenly. I mean, it's just like with the micronutrients, like uh, spreading, say, 200 grams of boron fertilizer is very difficult. But when you mix it with a micronutrient fertilizer where you apply half a ton, then it's much easier technically. Uh, or um, like um, 
when when it's uh, when there's when it's banned applied along the seed. I mean, it may be some biostimulants are not compatible or co cannot be applied directly to the seed itself, but maybe they should be brought close to it. And if a fertilizer goes there anyhow, um, I mean, I think there are options and I would wish that um, uh, this um, new industry, say, would interact uh, regularly with the established ones. Um, maybe there's uh, a lot of things to, to develop and to improve and to combine that would be my wish for, for this year. Thank you. OK, um, I, I take it from there. So uh, yes, we are always up to uh, bring different parties into interaction um, as, as we did right now. So many thanks to all of you. Um, that was an, uh, quite an intense round. Um, uh, let's, let's see where, where uh, the soil microbiome is heading to and uh, then we close it by now. So many thanks again and uh, see you soon, hopefully here in Hanover. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you everyone. Bye.